What's up everyone, Kevin from Epic Gardening here and this is a special video because if you remember this farm and this dude and this angle even, I think it's the same <laughs> angle, this is Stephen Cornett at Nature's Always Right. What's up everybody, glad to be back on the channel with you guys. So 2017, late 2017, I met Stephen and we filmed a random video with my cell phone and that video is probably how a lot of people have come to know both Steven and myself. Yeah, definitely. Um, and sort of kind of blew both of us up on YouTube a little bit and it's been really cool. We've become really good friends and as you can see, I mean look around guys, a lot has changed both in Steven and in his knowledge in the farm and in his farm itself. I mean we've got some really interesting stuff over there as you can see. So what we're gonna do is kind of do a throwback. We're gonna take you around Steven's farm m in much the same way as we did before, but you're gonna see what's changed in Steven as a farmer, in the mm -hmm. farm itself, and then in even some of the business practices that he's been doing here on the Market Garden here at Nature's Always Right. So I'm gonna flop behind the camera like I did before. This time, I will try to interrupt Steven less. <laughs> <laughs> I will interrupt you less. Um, <laughs> and we're, we're just gonna go ahead and see what's up. Yeah, full circle over here. Full circle. Here we are, and as you can see, it's looking beautiful. Steven, do you, do you mind just telling us kind of what's changed since the last time we did a video here? Sure, yeah. Well, welcome, welcome back, everybody. It's great to have you here again. Um, yeah, about two years later, you know, I'm uh, still doing everything. No till, beyond organic. I still use no type of pesticide, herbicide, none of that. And um, so, so far, the few things that have changed is maybe I've gotten uh, definitely a lot better at my crop rotations, um, growing crops that are, you know, very fast and I've also gotten rid of growing certain crops such as like carrots. I only have like one and a half beds of those going right now, whereas before I had a, a lot more going on. I remember when we did the video before, we were talking actually a lot about carrots, parsley, dill, etc. Why did you switch off the carrots? Uh, just because they take so long to grow and because I have so few beds here, I need more beds to be in rotation to have carrots. Now I now have another plot about 0.8 miles down the road, which gives me about eight more 40 foot garden beds. So that's allowed me to diversify a little bit more, but instead of having more diverse selection of crops, I'm kind of doubling down on those things that make me the most profit. And those crops would be what types of crops? Uh, absolutely salad mix. That is my number one seller. I'm able to sell like at least 25 pounds a week of salad mix um, and also side greens. So I'll sell tatsoi or Asian spinach, arugula, beet greens. I now do microgreens. You know, I'm still doing my root vegetables, uh, radishes and beets. I'm also doing herbs like you mentioned, the dill, parsley, cilantro, also the heads of lettuce. So just kind of doubling down on those things that are higher turnover and higher profit margin. And I see here, at least from last time I was here, which was not too long ago, mm -hmm. you had a bunch of trellising system up here, your lower and lean tomato system, and it looks like you've actually expanded to quite a few more 30 inch beds, right? Oh, yeah. 30 inch rows? Yeah, I added these in recently. I got approved by the landlords, which was awesome to, to do a couple more beds in here. So, you know, having more beds in rotation just gives me a lot more options and ability to do more varieties. So uh, coming up, here I have arugula. This is where my half bed of carrots is. And then on this final bed here, I had dill and cilantro and I didn't have enough of the transplant. So I just threw in some lettuce. Yeah, just whatever works. Whatever works, yeah. <clears throat> That's a technique I like to do a lot. If I have spaces in my beds, I'll just throw in lettuce or some herbs, something quick. Awesome, okay, so now we are gonna go ahead and take a look at some of the new stuff as we move over to this magical zone over here with your bootstrap farmer's greenhouse. Yes, that's been a huge upgrade to my farm this last year. So here we are in probably the biggest upgrade in the last two years, Steven's Definitely. bootstrap farmer greenhouse. So you kind of want to tell us, first of all, what kind of greenhouse is this? How'd you kind of get it set up? And then yeah. what do you got going on? So yeah, so this is a 10 foot by 20 foot greenhouse. So about 200 square feet. It's made from all galvanized fence posts actually. So everything in here is things that you could actually get from like Lowe's or Home Depot. And what's cool about the Bootstrap Farmer Kit is they give you a hoop bender, so um, it makes it a lot cheaper to build your own greenhouse. So I built all of these structural poles here, and my dad helped me build it and a couple of my friends, so thank you guys for helping me. And then and the rest of it is just from wood. These The sideboards here is all leftover fence post from um, my landlords who didn't want a piece of their fence. They just let me take it and use it. So mm. even the door itself is made from those leftover fence posts. Oh wow. So okay. I'm always trying to reuse things and do things as cheaply as possible. 
So what I'm using this greenhouse for, this is like a propagation house and also a microgreen growing house as well. I, I recently started doing microgreens commercially. So what this is gonna allow me to do is have a climate controlled area where I can do microgreens and propagations year round, have the best germination and the best growth possible. Okay, let's take a little closer look at some of the stuff you've got going on because you have some interesting seed starting arrangements yeah. here. Yeah, currently I'm doing a little trial. These are the wind strip trays from Never Sink Farm. Now these are plug trays that have the same air pruning effect as soil blocks, but has the speed of plug trays. So you're just putting in dry soil mix, watering, adding the seed, covering, and you're done. Can we take a little closer look at what makes these so unique? Because I, I did it and I, wanna, I want everyone else to see it as well. Yeah, see if you can see the crack there. Yep, so you can see right here, there's a cracks. There's obviously a, a hole at the bottom, but there's cracks on the side that effectively make it almost as as aerated or as porous, I mm -hmm. guess, as a soil block. And Stephen's going to show you a soil block right so, here. Oops. And so this is effectively just trying to mimic the soil block effect mm -hmm. while saving the time of forming them, right? So you can see how good those roots look. Oh yeah. I mean, that's this is what's so awesome about the soil blocks is that when you put this into the ground, the plant just takes off. There's no transplant shock. Um, just better root st structure from the beginning. If we take a look at the root structure on this guy, it's pretty similar. And you're not seeing a lot of that spiralizing that you'll see on a plug tray, which mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you in a second here. Yep. So this is excellent very similar to the soil block but quicker so i'm very excited about these plug trays and which i will probably be switching completely over to let's see what these look like oh, these actually look pretty good if i let them go for another week or two they would really start to spiral they'd start coming around right here right yeah yeah especially at the bottom this is yeah. where really yeah and you can twirl. you can almost see them beginning that process right mm -hmm. there but they all look really healthy so i'm doing a little trial right now of the different type of trays and soil blocks and kind of seeing what is the most beneficial is it worth the time to create the soil blocks now that we have these really nice plug trays all right well the greenhouse is popping clearly microgreens seedlings everywhere let's go ahead and check out those chickens all right here we go so last time you guys were here, I might have touched on the passion fruit idea, but it was probably really tiny at that time. And so the whole concept is of the passion fruit vine was to give a huge shade structure for my chickens because heat is one of the most detrimental things to chickens. They can handle really cold weather, but when it comes to heat, especially the hot, dry San Diego temperatures, like, you know, they can die possibly. So the idea is to give it a lot of shade while getting a food source. So I've got some passion fruits already and there's uh more passion flowers here oh that's gorgeous one of the most beautiful flowers out there oh yeah so i'm hoping that this year i'm going to get a lot more fruit i can take these to the market to sell them you can get about 50 cents a piece for these so they're quite expensive and these produce quite prolifically as well so yeah this is a fantastic feature of my coop now so you can get 50 cents a piece per passion fruit and that's a perennial flowering yes. vine yes oh wow it's amazing yeah. and it's shading out these guys which we're going to take a look at right now yep let's check them out let's check them out if you haven't seen my video all about setting up this chicken coop i talk about all the different design features that go into it check it out on my youtube channel but i've got an automatic gravity fed uh, feeders for my grain and then also automatic water feeders so basically this coop is so easy to use i just come out and collect the eggs i refill the food 12 to 12 to 14 days um, the water during winter, it's it actually collects uh, rainwater, so I'm not even filling it up. Just in the summer, about once a month, I refill the barrel. It's very easy to use. And essentially all I do is come out here, collect eggs. Voila, look at that, amazing. And, uh, and then that's it, I come out, you know, and I'm feeding them little treats every day. They're getting chard and kale and, you know, different farm leftovers, of course. And you were saying that, you know, a lot of the times your clippings from over here, mm -hmm. some of your, you know, the microgreens that have been spent and cut instead of, you know, a lot of people ask questions, but what do you do with your microgreen soil once you're done with them? And you have a pretty unique situation yeah. for that. That's one of the reasons why I have animals because they can process all of that waste for me, yeah. but it's actually an incredible food source for them. It saves me a little bit of money, makes their eggs more nutritious and they're making compost for me. So it's a really great synergistic system. So another great free food source that you might have available to you if you have breweries in your area is spent beer grain. So and we do here in San Diego, we've got hundreds got of them. And I'm really close to La Mesa, which is a city that has a lot of restaurants and stuff. So this is the leftover grain that they make 
the mash with. I forgot what they call it, I'm not really sure. But um, basically it's just uh, oats or it could be wheat. Barley. Barley, yes, exactly. And um, it's just great feed, supplemental feed for my chickens. Saves me some money. Um, I'm taking care of a waste stream in the community. Uh, I also plan on feeding this to my soldier fly larva setup once I get that going again as well. So it's great to have this as a resource now. So we thought the tour was coming to a close, but Steven's got a surprise for us. So about the same time when you did that last video, I got permission for my neighbors to kind of mess around over here. So I've got a, a new project going on and some kind of perennial things going on as well. So let's check this out. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> An entirely new plot of land almost. Yeah. So, you know, the neighbors kind of let me go crazy over here. So one of the big things I'm doing now that I'm experimenting with are grow bags. And a grow bag, it's just like a, it's just a fabric pot. It is made from like recycled plastic, food grade, uh, BPA free plastic. And basically I've got loaded in here compost mixed with 20% perlite. And then I'm gonna be planting different varieties of herbs, uh, greens, peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, certain things that I will sell direct to customer, uh, certain things, uh, like I'm selling the nursery plant to them, some things I'm gonna actually harvest and sell to my customers. So like, I don't wanna put my peppers out in my high production beds that I wanna be turning over very quickly peppers aren't as high of a profit margin so I'm gonna dedicate this area for them as well and I'm really excited to see how grow bags can work in a market gardening context. Do all these have the same soil mix in them or is that yeah. are you customizing that based on the plant? I just put straight compost mixed with the perlite and then depending on the plant I'm putting in I will add amendment like the fertilizer I need like for instance my peppers I'm going to be putting in a fertilizer with more phosphate and uh, different minerals that it needs for blossoming and stuff. Got it and you You've got a couple other things going on here, right? Sort of like a yeah. permaculture perennial yeah. bed. Yeah, so any of my extra stuff that I had, I would just throw out here. I have an irrigation system built out here, and last year I grew a bunch of watermelons and melons out here. I'm gonna be switching out some of these kales that you see mm -hmm. going to flower for melons. This is just kind of my fun experimental area. Um, where I can just screw around. These are um, tree collards, which I really loved this year because they taste just like collard greens, but these are actually are not bolting and they just keep growing up and up and up and I can keep harvesting them. So it's a great way to get vertical space. I remember John Kohler, who's been to both of our gardens, is, is yeah. huge on the tree collards. He and that's gave kind me of, the idea, actually. Yeah, <laughs> he, the, he put them on the map for me as well. Yeah. Uh, and so what do you got going on right behind you? Yeah, so up here, it's kind of hard to see with a lot of the weeds, but I've got uh, various different flowers. So this is yarrow. You can see the yarrow flower. Yeah, yeah. This is rosemary. The comfrey is coming back from last year. Down here, I've got oregano. So um, just like a wild pollinator slash herb garden. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just so, yeah, for more biodiversity. And then, uh, you know, kind of circling around the mound here is a bunch of artichoke. And this is the second year, so I should be getting some artichokes this year. I'm really excited. I'm waiting to see the, the flowers start to come up, but yeah. nothing yet, so. Yeah, really it's nice cool. use of effectively what once was wasted space. I remember when we were here last time, this was yeah. just overgrown in a non-productive way, and now it's overgrown in a productive way. Absolutely. Yep. And it's fun. It's fun to have a little experimental area where I kind of just go crazy. Like, that's my business focus, and this is more for me to have, like, a fun area. All right, well, that is an update, and of course there's a lot more that we could say, but if you're coming to this video, that means you've probably seen the original video with mm -hmm. Steven, the classic, and uh, you can always refer to that, and then you can always check out Steven's channel. But we did have a ton of comments and a ton of questions about Steven himself and just sort of like how his life is um, living this life. It's a, it's a very different, it's a very unconventional life, and a lot of questions that we had were, simply people either doubting that you could make it on mm -hmm. land like this or just wondering you know what is your actual day-to-day -day life like especially mm -hmm. now that you've been established yeah yeah i'd love to touch on all that stuff so i guess financially the way i got started doing this i worked another job i was an english teacher at an international school here in san diego um, working full-time while setting up this farm. I took about a year to set this up and as I had that job I was able to pay off all my initial investments. So I bought my truck, I bought all the irrigation, my main tools, my seeds, you know, the major costs of this startup business, let's just say including my truck, let's call it 10 grand right? or maybe a little less than that. I paid all that off up front before I quit that job. 
and that was a major thing. I also, me and my wife don't have any type of debt. That is another major thing that made this possible for me. Yeah. If I had those other things or I had an expensive car, you know, this may not have been viable, but you know, we both drive like 1999 cars. Yeah. Know? I mean, we're yeah. very low cost. We're kind of minimalist. We don't go out very much. We're living a very, very simple life. And that is how financially I'm able to do this. Yeah. Also, I made sure my business was creating revenue before I quit that other job. Yep. This business completely pays for whatever costs I'm, I'm incurred through the business. I'm able to pay my rent with the business, pay for our food, like the, our major expenses, I'm able to pay with this. My wife, of course, works as well. She has her own business. So that's how we're generating the, the rest of the income to save money and, and you know plan for our future, I guess. Right, right. But, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think the thing that struck me when I was reading through the comments on the other video is just, you know, if you're doing what you want to do, this is, it's your business, but it's your avocation too. It's something you like and enjoy. Yes. And yeah. so hobbies wise, I mean, for me, I like to go rock climbing. So I have a membership to a rock climbing gym, but yeah. I don't go to the club. I'm not popping bottles at the club. Yeah. You're not popping <laughs> bottles at the club. Definitely not. Like the, the expenses <laughs> for living a, a different life, it's a trade off, right? So like Steven gets to come out and yeah. work in the yard and farm and create content for people. Mm -hmm. The thing you touched on that I think was important when I started mine too was no debt make sure you know it's working before you actually just say, boom, I'm going yeah. whole hog on it, you know? Cause yep. when we did our first video, I remember you you were still working mm -hmm. the, the English job yeah. and you were still paying off some of the initial setup costs. Mm -hmm. And um, just to touch on that a little bit more, we had a lot of questions about, there's no way you could have done this with only however many thousand. I think yeah. back then, if you didn't include the truck, it was 7,500 bucks. Yeah, and maybe. so what would you say to someone who is seeing this video and, and wants to do something on this scale and just thinks that they can't do it on a budget. I mean, I think there's plenty of examples online of, of people doing it. I mean, Curtis often quotes like $5,000 to start something up and I completely agree with that, especially I've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of other farmers now yeah. all over the world even and it's around that five grand mark to start up something similar to this. Um, you can really bootstrap the whole thing, honestly. Um, yeah. You know, from the, the walk-in fridge that you can build using a cool bot, from, you know, drip tape irrigation, which is very cheap, or you could just do an overhead type sprinkler setup. Um, there's many ways that you can save costs on things. And the other big thing is finding a lease-free situation. Yes. This plot and my second plot that I now have, I have found people that find so much value in what I'm doing and getting food from me and eggs every single week and that the fact that their yard is extremely beautiful, they don't have to do anything, that is enough value for them to just allow me to use the land. That is something that I think anybody can find now, at least in America, I can speak for America. This, the concept of this has risen in popularity yeah. so much now. There's a lot of people willing to do this. And I did research when I tried to find my second plot, I, I went on nextdoor.com and I put a post on there and I had about 20 different families contact me and say, Stephen, please do this at our house. This is just in a little 10 square, like five square mile area. Yeah. That many people were interested. Yeah. So, you know, times have changed and, and people are really interested in growing their own food or letting someone else do it. On yeah. Land. Yeah. I mean, I had, um, I had someone else on the podcast recently and they were saying the same thing in Florida. Yeah. His problem was not finding land it was choosing someone <laughs> of the two to five dozen people that right. wanted to give their front yard up. And, it's tricky. And, you know, it's it's a very tricky scenario. So guys, this was our this was our cool epic update of that original video. And if you're watching this video and you haven't seen that, I highly encourage you to go watch that. And then since that video came out, Steven's been putting out really high quality market farm and market garden content on his YouTube channel and on Instagram, he's on some podcasts as well. So if this is something that, that you wanna do or even have an inkling of wanting to do, highly recommend checking his channel out. Uh, it's just much more focused towards the practical business and mm -hmm. farming strategies rather than someone like on my channel that's more just urban gardening, home gardener tactics. So check Steven out at Nature's Always Right. Mm -hmm. And you know we're gonna be doing some more collabs in the future. So if you wanna see something in particular, maybe something caught your eye, let us know in the comments and we're neighbors and we're friends. Yeah. So I'll just jet on over here and we'll do another one. So until next time, good luck in the garden and keep on growing. See you guys soon. Later. Bye.